face and then do my, and that took care of not, not having to sand up here, which I thought was also genius. But in Sip looking at it, and I thought, something's not right, and I can't figure. I was too close. I could not figure out what I didn't like about this. So I posted it back on to World of Woodturners, and I said, okay, guys, I need your help. What's wrong with this? Well, they were as enamored as I was with the, the technical ability of making a square opening. <laughs> and all I got was Atta Girls and, wow, that's amazing. And I didn't get anybody to say, oh, honey, that's but ugly. And this is why. Which brings me back to the whole critique thing. One thing that when someone is critiquing, if they say, you know, this doesn't work for me. Wow, something, I'm just not, I'm struggling with this. The first thing you want to ask them is why. Do not accept I don't like that and leave it. That's not helpful. You want, if they say, wow, I'm struggling with that or, whoa, I don't like that. The next question you say is why. Tell me why. What is it that doesn't appeal to you? Because then you can consider it and weigh it and go, oh, no, I hadn't thought about that. Or, oh, well, there's a reason and blah, 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 blah. But you need to know why. If they go, wow, that's fabulous. Your next question is, why? What is it that's pulling you into this? I'm going to digress a moment. I will come back to that. When I had the two panels on that piece that Don traded with me. He says, you know, Molly, the two panels are, the panels are pretty cool, but why'd you do two? He says, because when I look at that first panel of the, of the hunters around that campfire, I have no idea there's any other panel on this vessel. If it's sitting on a, a mantle or a, a a bookcase or, or somehow being displayed, and I see that panel, I have no reason to come explore it further because I can see an image and I have no idea there's anything else going on. If you have instead three panels, people will see, they'll look at that one panel and, and they'll be off in the very edge over here, there will be a hint of something else going on. You'll be able to see a very tiny portion of another panel, which will make them want to come over, pick the piece up, and then explore it and turn it. And go, oh, oh, there's more, oh, there's more. And they'll keep going and they'll going. I have people come, would come into a sale that I would do, or where I was when I was selling something, and they'd look at it, you know, and their, their moms always taught them don't touch, so they're always coming like this. And if someone comes in like that, and they're going like this, and they're going like this, and then they walk away, and then they come back again, and they can't leave it alone visually, all I have to do is go, here, you got to touch this. Take a look at that. And I put it in their hands, and they stop walking away, except for it's in their pocket when they walk away, and I have more green in my hand. Because the, the whole experience is visual and tactile. So he said, Molly, if you have three panels, you're looking at one, there's a hint that there's something else. They will want to pick it up, but they're going to touch it. They touch it, they're going to buy it. Because it's, it hits all of those. So if you have a piece that you want people to touch, do something that will draw them in and then want to explore more. So back to this one. I just had, had to make that point. So, if, so no one said anything, and I was kind of going, shoot, because I, I can't figure it out. And then I got an email from Wally Dickerman. Anyone know Wally? He passed away a couple of years, two, two years or something like that. Anyway, great guy. Started turning when he was about 14 years old, and I think he passed away at like 90-something, 90 92, 93 or something. So he forgot more about turning than anyone can even remember. He's just and a sweetheart, really nice guy. And he emailed me and he goes, Molly, I'm having some struggles with that piece. Do you want some feedback on it? I'm like, oh, for thank you. Yes, what's wrong with this? And he goes, I want you to do an experiment. I want you to get a piece of paper. Can we get a little bit of a close-up here, but not a real fine close-up? Let's get, no, side view. There you go. 
And then right about, a little bit, right about there. Okay. So once you get a piece of paper, and I want you to um, hold it up and down on the rim about an inch. And then look at it. And then take the paper away. And then put it back. Notice anything? The neck is too long. It's out of proportion. The score line? That wasn't, that's not the issue. The issue is that the neck was too long. It was, it threw the overall proportion of the piece out of whack. One third, two third, yep. And I went, oh, I'll be darned. Look at that. He goes, one more thing. <laughs> God bless him. He says, take a look at the top, and we're just going to keep it. Yeah, see how flat it is? He says, it looks like you took a machete and sliced it straight across. And it is dead flat on the top of this rim. The human eye, whether we realize it or not, wants things on a vessel to flow. So that your assumption is that there's probably going to hold some form of liquid. If you turned it out to pour it, that rough edge, there's a couple of things. It doesn't, it wouldn't allow the, the, the liquid to flow well. But also visually, when it's a dead flat right here, your eyes kind of slam to the edge of that and don't have anywhere to go. You want the vision to kind of pull yourself into the vessel. He says, so I would suggest that you think about altering the very top rim of this so that it kind of tilts down into it or kind of flows down into the, into the vessel. So I took those two elements that he suggested and made a second vessel. It's smaller, but it's still the basic form is very similar. So let's go to a side view on this. And now look at them. This one works. This one I look at and go, ooh, happy, happy, happy. But this one, compared to them, this one doesn't work. This one does work. Also on the top, I slightly tilted the, the rim inward that flows more. That's the difference of another good critique. A couple of elements that I could not put my finger on. I'm going to pass these around together. I hope I'm not going to... Can you come get them so my feedback doesn't deafen everybody? Oh, you'll be fine. It's not, yeah, it's a little bit more abrupt. The curve is a little bit more abrupt on the larger one. Not, it doesn't flow as much, yeah, as the other one does. But again, that's the va another value of getting some feedback or, or, again, paying attention to overall proportion, which kind of brings me to one of the things I want to um, illustrate about the whole issue of proportion. So... Here I have an image, the same image, side by side. Now, sometimes when you're turning your vessel on the lathe, this is the image that you have that you want to produce. And every once in a while, so the whole issue, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. The rim, when Christian said, just because it comes off the lathe round doesn't mean it has to stay that way is also another way of saying don't let your equipment or your tools dictate what form you are going to produce. Just because the lathe made that opening round doesn't mean that your finished product has to stay round. The same thing is your chuck or a tool you might have. Just because, uh, for example, 
Let me see here. I'm going to see if I can draw it here. When, you know, we, t are, we turn on a horizontal plane, right? So I can't draw really, really well here, but I'm going to give you... So my chuck is right here. That's my chuck. And I come down and I want to make... Uh, my intent is to have the base of my piece be visually kind of round all the way through. Now I'm going to go back and put a little bit of a, a divot here for it to sit on the, on the table, but I want visually this line to be in, uninterrupted as if the, the base is round because it gives a lift and lightness to the visually because it gives a little shadow underneath there. But as I'm turning it, I'm getting close to my chuck and I'm going, dang. I'm going to hit that chuck if I'm not careful. Oh, well, what I'll do is just put a pedestal on it. Don't do that. Don't do that. You turned the exterior of that form to be pedestal-less, to not have a pedestal. If you let getting too close to your chuck dictate, ah, I don't want to run into the chuck, I better just put a pedestal on it. What have you just done? You've thrown the proportion wonky and out of proportion, just like that neck being too long and not working. Now you've added something on the bottom. And you have... You know, I'm guilty. I, when I started, I was like, I don't know how to take that off without bumping into the chuck. I'll just put a pedestal on it. No, that piece never worked. What's the point if it's not going to work? I bet you have seen things on your show and tell table that might look like that sometime because someone is just starting out hollowing but they're still a little bit, because they're a little bit new to the craft, they're a little bit intimidated by our equipment. Don't let your equipment and your tools dictate. What you can do instead, if you're getting close to that chuck, <clears throat> is take it out of the chuck, turn a little cone of wood to put into the chuck, a little scrap piece of a cone, turn it around so that now the neck is being held by that cone. Bring the tail stock up. And now you can get that curve. Now you can get access to the bottom of your vessel without running into your equipment. And you can maintain that curve and not interrupt it. You'll be able to maintain that and keep that lift. So find, if your equipment or if a tool is preventing you from doing something, see if you can figure out how to get around that tool or that piece of equipment. And if you can't do it, you have a wealth of knowledge in this club. And come up in one of your meetings and say, okay, I'm struggling with something, my chuck's too... I mean, what do people do? Take it, you have mentors, right? Go to one of your mentors. Turn to the guy sitting next to you and say, hey, you ever make hollow forms? How do you get it? <laughs> when you get close to that chuck, what do you do? <coughs> you have a, a wealth of knowledge in here. Take advantage of that. Don't let that equipment dictate. <coughs> How do you make that indent down here on the bottom? Just a sec. I don't know if you all have heard, but I have to stop turning and teaching. And this is why. <coughs> I've developed an allergy to dust and smoke, which irritates my throat, which makes me cough, which triggers a brain condition I have that gives me splitting headaches. So let me suck on this a sec so I don't get my headaches. <laughs> Okay, how do I put that little divot right here, right? <coughs> okay, so 
you have the, the rim on that little cone, you have your tailstock right here. <clears throat> when you have come all the way down, or pretty darn close, to finishing that curve, take your parting tool and come in at this angle. And that will cut. And that tiny little last nubbins about a quarter of an inch, because you don't want to, with end grain, if this is an end grain piece, you can leave a pretty small little connection right down here at your uh, tailstock, and it chances are you, <clears throat> it's not going to break off and fly across the room. <clears throat> if this were a side grain piece, where the grain's running in this direction, don't leave a tiny little piece there because side grain is going to snap and it's going to fly off. But if it's an end grain, because most of my, almost all of my hollow forms are end grain. <coughs> Sorry. And that's what, you can leave that last little nubbin and then carve it off with a carving tool or just the, your gouge. <coughs> i got to lubricate my throat. So, so pay attention to all of the different elements that go into the, the creation of that piece. Make them deliberate. So that if you get a critique and someone says, how come you did this? It's not necessarily that it's going to be bad. It's just they're, they're curious. They want to pull that. Was it deliberate? Was it, I don't know, it came off the lathe that way? Or was it, well... When I was researching, blah, 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 you made an intentional decision. Make sense? Oh, gosh, look at the time. Um, any other questions that I may not have hit or if you saw something earlier and said, I wonder how she did that? <clears throat> I have a handout that I normally send ahead of time and forgot to. But I will send, um, I'm going to be sending that to your newsletter guy, and he's going to either email it out all to you, or it will be on your website or in your newsletter. You will have access to all that information. And on that handout, I have um, some of the different books that I use for reference. If you um, go across media, medium, here's a, here's a book that is amazing. Potter's Direct Shape and Form. You know what? I can't remember if this one's on my handout. If this, if this kind of goes, whoa, to you at the end when we're done here, come on up and write down the title and the author so you can find it. But what's really cool about this is that they, you know, I gotta get it. They have examples of form. <coughs> and so you can see the pottery image of mugs or something like here, but then they give you an illustrated half view of how to recreate that form. That's how these little, these are, isn't it beautifully symmetrical that this line matches this line? You know how I did that? I told it over a piece of paper and I did it with a side view just like this. <laughs> then I cut it out and opened it up and traced it on here so that I could have two beautiful little form frames for you to look at. <laughs> That's the whole idea of this. When you're looking at as finding or thinking about a new form that you want to explore, here's some bowls or cups. They give you half of it. So you just fold a piece of paper and then you can just draw this and then cut it out and open it up and you've got the full form. But this gives you bowls and vases, all kinds of really, oh, these are handles, but some people make teapots and stuff like that out of wood. But what I got it for were like vase forms and bowl forms and lidded box forms. It's, it's beautiful. It's a cool, cool book. So anyway, a, a reference there. Yes, sir. Uh, this is pottery. I can't turn anymore. So I, uh, there are a lot of transferable skills from um, wood turning that apply to throwing pottery on a wheel. 
We do it on a horizontal plane, they do it on a vertical plane, but form, design, I was like, I've taken one class and I thought I want to see if I can get the feel of the primitive that I want in clay. And so I took a class in Snohomish at Bruning Pottery. And then I used, um, so I was looking at form. Can I reproduce the t style of forms that I want in clay? I just brought along to brag. <laughs> Look, you can do other mediums. Anyway, it was, I was very, this is going to go into an exhibit. Um, I got invited to this called New Horizons. They wanted I, people that have an iconic style and then doing something completely different from that. So anyway, I just, I like that. Any other, yes, sir? Ah, the metallic finishes. Uh, it is on the handout that I will be, uh, that you'll be getting. It is a product called Gilder's Paste. And and this is my little sample board here. What I've done is I've taken a, uh, just a piece of plywood and gritted it out and carved into it the, the name of the color of the Gilder's paste, painted it black, and then put the paste over the top so I could have a reference board of it. It's, um, it's a solvent-based, it's mineral spirit-based wax, and it looks like shoe polish. It comes in a little tin just like kiwi. Um, shoe polish and uh, you rub your finger on it or some kind of an applicator and then you I use it to highlight um, the branding and the carving and the texturing imagery that I put on pieces so for example this one these little S forms on here is a piece of nichrome wire that I've bent into a brand and then I stamped or imprinted into the surface of the wood. So I used copper over the smooth top surface of the vessel after I painted it black and then so that the copper then highlights that black imprint. The, um, the basket weed brand that I, was, that I showed you on, um, <coughs> on this vessel the same brand was used on this one in just a different pattern. So I have a herringbone and then a basket weave pattern. So the brands are made either nichrome wire or um, the head of a copper nail. I can form that into a shape and then I attach it to a wood burning pen. Heat that heats it and then I just stamp designs in. These are all brands. So I've got a spiral brand the S spiral. This one is two touches of kind of a figure eight. I think I have, you know, here's. So this brand, here's one touch of the, that brand and then I just did two touches to make that little kind of flowery. This is, this brand is actually two touches of, a, it was kind of a clover leaf and then I just, Aligned it so that it looked like a jigsaw puzzle. So it's two you touches. You borrowed that on my leash one. Excuse me? <laughs> you borrowed that on my leash one. I did borrow that one from Mark. <laughs> sort of, kind of. But he doesn't make a brand. He doesn't freehand it. Here's one that's uh, heart-shaped. There's another piece of nichrome wire. So... Seems that, like, it seems like you can make a signature that way without having a custom order. Yeah, a lot of the things, she said that people can make a signature stamp or something like that out of that, so you don't have to custom order one or something. You can with, it has its limitations. Uh, sharp edges are, um, are a challenge. Uh, you, have, you have to recognize that whatever image that you want to imprint has to have two legs to it. So it has to come up with a straight leg, go through the design, and then come down the second leg because those two legs of the brand have to go into the wood burning pen in order to get the current to go up one side and down the other and heat that edge. And then surface area is important, you know, how much you can get full contact of that as you apply it to a curved surface. So there, there are some limitations to it, but there's also an amazing amount of creativity that can be brought into it as well. My DVD, a small 15 second, um, 
commercial, info commercial. This DVD shows you how to make six different brands using the nichrome wire and um, copper nails. So there's the basket, it shows you how to do the basket weave, the S brand, a regular spiral, a spiral with a tail, a rope um, brand, and a star that's made out of a copper, the head of a copper nail. And it shows, goes through the equipment that you might need for, for wood burn, you know, to heat the brands. It's filmed, I went to a professional videographer, he filmed right over my shoulder so that when I'm making it, you see exactly what I see. And then there's application of those brands. A little bit on the gilder's paste and other ways of embellishing or patina in that. And so anyway, that's what that is. Any other questions? I hope that has given some things, some ideas to think about when you go to embellish something. Be deliberate. That's the main thing. Analyze what you want to do. Be deliberate in your choices and, and commit to them. Don't kind of just sort of go into it because then you want crisp. You want clear, deliberate intent. Thank you very much for inviting me.